How's it going lads? Welcome back to the workshop. Today we're going to talk about the mother of all hand planes. The biggest hand plane Stanley ever produced at four feet long and three inches wide. That is the Stanley number eight. Now when I first started getting into woodwork I went through a phase that I think a lot of people go through where they try to collect as many hand planes as possible. The first one I ever got was the number five here and then I think I got myself a number four and I was like right I need to get the full collection one through eight. So I started collecting as much as I could, seeing what I could find online, going around to car boot sales, uh, and I soon found that you actually don't need to do all this. A number five will get you through 90% of the jobs you need to get done, so if you're looking for your first plane, get this fella. Then you might want to get yourself a number four, because that'll act as a smoothing plane to finish your work, and you can modify it to be a scrub plane. But then, finally, you'd probably want to go get yourself a nice jointer plane i got the number seven and i used that to joint all the edges of my board so they'd stick together and flatten the surfaces but during my quest to accumulate as many tools as i possibly could or as many planes as i could i picked up this number eight and like many of the tools you'll see here like my number six here they don't get a whole pile of use this fella has a bit of surface rust so i've sold many of them i haven't got around to selling this one yet but uh, i will eventually but unfortunately for the number eight it was one of them tools that sat underneath my bench barely used for probably a year and then when i brought all the tools that were going to be put inside this box i brought them all up to my bedroom so i could clean them and prepare them for the box and then i was out in the garage and i needed to join to plane and it was lashing rain and i didn't want to go back inside so i just pulled out the number eight from under the bench and put it to use. Now, I'd never used this plane before. I actually didn't even test it before buying it, which I probably should have in hindsight. Um, but it's working fairly well, but I don't think it's working how it should. So in this video, I'm going to flatten the sole here by basically getting a big old granite slab. Let's pull out this fella here. Up she comes. And I have some sandpaper here that I'm just gonna fold over the corners and then I'm gonna run the number eight up and down until I know the sole is dead flat. So once we have it in place, we're just gonna retract the iron just so we're not um, sending that by using our adjustment knob here to just suck the iron up into the body of the plane. And once we can see it's not sticking out, we can spend ages going like this. Now a fun trick you can do if you can find a pencil, which I never seem to be able to do for some reason, you can rub graphite into the sole of the plane and the, the parts that get rubbed off easily, there they will be the high spots. Uh, you need to keep on going until all the graphite is done. So let me see if I can find an old pencil for myself. Here's one and no, why would it ever have a lead sticking out the end of it? So we'll just grab our chisel here and just get to work. So here we have the pencil ready to go now and we're just gonna draw all along the sole of the plane. This does take some time and practice, but hopefully, after a while, you'll have the whole thing dead flat. So, in the last plane restoration I did, I didn't have the frog or the blade attached. And I was recently informed that that can make a difference. You do want to have those attached to the plane when you're lapping the sole, so. That's what we're gonna do for this one, so. I'm just gonna go flat out here for a while and I'll get back to you guys when I have this fella dead flat. We can see here now, some patches of the graphite are gone, but a lot remain, so. I'll talk to you in a bit. So once I'm fairly happy with the sole, I'm also going to turn the plane onto its side now. I'm not too bothered about it being a perfect 90 degrees because I don't think I'm ever going to be using this as a shooting plane. So I'm just going to give it a few passes like that until everything seems nice and clean. We can actually see in here uh, the initials JWO. So I'm assuming that was one of the past owners of the plane one time is after punching his initials into it. It's very cool. It's one of the things I love about the older tools is all the... It's you're, like you're sharing experience with all the past owners and users of this plane. Something magical that you don't get with the new tools. It's also a huge testament to the quality that these older tools were built to. A lot of the modern power tools we use, they're only going to last about 10 years. They're certainly not going to last through multiple generations. Now, there are modern manufacturers that are still making high quality hand tools and they'll no doubt last generations. But these were everyday tools used by everyday working people. And it's just cool to think that they can be passed down through so far in time if they're just well looked after and maintained. So I'm happy now that I'm after lapping the sole till it's completely flat. The one test you can do is just spray any liquid on the granite slab you are using uh, and place the sole of the plane on top of it. Kind of rub it in, make sure the whole sole is covered in that liquid, whatever it be. 
and then if you lift it up it should like stick to the granite slab so we can see there now we're getting some fairly serious stick we're actually nearly able to lift the whole slab up so that's how we know we're dead flat i wonder are the sides um completely flat i doubt it i wasn't too worried about getting them dead flat but um yeah we can see there's a bit of stick but we're certainly not um certainly not going to be able to lift the slab up but uh definitely a bit of um a bit of friction there or a bit of suction even anyway i'm going to clean down the sole of the plane and the slab and then we're going to start working on the rest of the plane so i bought this plane already somewhat fixed up i'm not too sure who but someone down the line has replaced this handle this would originally have been rosewood it looks like beach now it doesn't bother me too much this is a user plane instead of a collector's plane and also the front knob seems to be beach um, that's been um, ebonized so that it looks black i can also tell that the paint or the japanning as it's known isn't original someone must have come along at some point but um, it doesn't bother me either it looks like a fairly complete paint job so i'm just going to find my screwdriver here and we're going to take the whole thing apart so we're going to start with the frog screws and they are what grabs the frog onto the sole of the plane so this is what i was on about earlier i was saying if we took this off when we were doing our lapping apparently it kind of holds the plane in like tension or something so it slightly changes the shape of it so when you're lapping your planes i think it's better to leave that on i've heard varying opinions i haven't found it makes too much of a difference but do whatever you want i'm also just going to take off the handles here for the time being uh, I might give them a bit of oil later, but you know what? I don't think they need it. I think they're fine. I think this plane just needs to be sharpened and she's pretty much ready to go. And another plane, I restored a four and a half in a recent video. So you can check that out. But um, we lapped the frog here dead flat. When you're using a plane, you want the iron and the chip breaker to sit completely flush with this. Um, so you want to make it dead flat. With a lot of the newer planes, they're very poorly machined. So you probably do want to give them a lapping. But for this plane, it looks to be all right. So again, probably not necessary, but I'm just going to give the main body of the plane a quick clean down. Basically, a lot of sawdust can build up in here, so you just kind of want to get rid of that so everything's locked together tightly and you don't have soft wood getting in the way of your flush, tight joints on the plane. So we're just going to give it a quick clean there now and move on to the iron then. So we're just going to separate the iron from the chip breaker here. I remember the fellow I was buying this off had two standing number eights for sale, uh, but he didn't want to swap the irons. Uh, the other plane was a bit nicer than that one but it also had very little of its iron left. Like even this one here, you can see only has about maybe an inch of life left in it. Now this will probably see me through for how often I use this plane, but I'd say it'd be hard enough to buy a, a replacement original iron from. But for flattening the iron, it's pretty straightforward. We're just gonna pull out our diamond stone here. I'm gonna lube it up with WD-40. You can see now I really need to get a long-term sponsorship for them. The amount of times I use and mention their product in the video. Now, this plane, or this diamond stone is a bit dirty, so I'm also going to give that a quick clean, real quick. So we have a thousand grit diamond stone here, and we're just going to make sure the back is dead flat. And yeah, I can see right off the bat that it is completely flat. Now, something I haven't done in a while is use a honing guide. I've kind of been doing everything freehand, but I think... For the sake of this plane, I'm just going to do it um, with the honing guide. So I'm just going to grind this straight on to 30 degrees. And to do that, you need to grab your rule here and uh, extend this out to, what is it? Um, 38 millimeters. So I'm just going to place this fella down here, if I can, put him on the table. And then match 38 millimeters here. Lovely hurling. And then we're just going to screw it back into place with our fingers grab our favorite screwdriver here and lock everything home so once we have that done then i'm going to bring it back onto the diamond stone and just go like that for a while once i'm done then i'm going to put a bit of a bevel on this so i'm going to lean to the left uh, for a few passes and then i'm going to come over and lean to the right and that should kind of give the plane the slightest curve at the edge of the blade just to stop the corners of the iron digging into the wood and leaving a mark. So for the last few passes, I find that pulling it towards me makes it that tad bit easier. So we're just gonna do that. Basically lift it every time we push it forward and then drag it back. Lastly then, we're just gonna come along with our strap here and I'm just gonna use that to remove the burr for one thing, but also it kind of gives it a nicer polished edge. So we're just gonna give it a few polishes on this now, I used to have strapping compound that made things a lot quicker, but if 
for the life of me, I can't find it. So for now, we're just going to have to do a few more extra passes to make up for what the strapping compound would have done. Now, of course, to test out the iron, we're going to see if it has any hair after growing back on our arm. And the answer seems to be no. There's a patch here we might try, actually. So, oh God, that could be a problem if we go like that. And yeah, we seem to be taking hairs away, no problem. So I'm going to do a quick test on my leg as well, just to be sure. You can see we're working our way up fairly well, but yeah, all that hair is coming clean off with this iron. So that's plenty sharp enough for me anyway, I'd say. So once I'm happy that we have it sharpened, I'm going to put the whole thing back together. So I'm going to grab our chip breaker here, just place that down in front of us. When I first started using this plane, I flattened the chip breaker as well. So I basically ran it along the diamond stone, but you don't need to do that too often. So we're just going to put it back together like this. Make sure there's no hairs getting in under our chip breaker. I like to bring it to just about maybe one millimeter uh, away from the edge. And then I lock it into place incredibly tight just so there's no chance of it moving anywhere. So I'm going to grab my screwdriver there, turn her upside down and just drive her home while i have the chance as well something i like to do is just pop out the um the little copper screws that hold the the tote and the knob into place and then if i can find any steel wool lying about the place which usually i can back here for example then i just twist it in like that for a while and that just gives it very quick clean and kind of makes it look a bit better not totally necessary not necessary at all actually but um i you know i like to have my tools looking somewhat nice when you're using them just kind of you take a bit more pride in them when they're like that you know anyway we're going to screw it all back together there now there was a different knob on a plane i had one time and i remember screwing it tight and uh, it actually split the knob and oh i was devastated you know you're supposed to look after these tools for the next generation and here i am thinking destroying them but no i wouldn't be too worried about the knob they're literally one of the easiest parts of a plane to replace or make I know some fellas that throw out the knobs the second they get a plane and then make their own knobs because they feel like they can make a better one for their, the shape of their own hand. So, you know, it's really whatever works best for the user. As well, something I found with the older planes is that the knobs are kind of shorter and fatter. I'll show you there now when I have this fella in. Uh, but if we see here, we have a, a Stanley number 605. So it's a bedrock plane. You can see there it's got the different shape on the body. But look how much taller the knob is compared to this fella here. So a lot of my friends I've talked to tend to prefer the, the taller knobs, but I don't know. I feel like um, they're better if you're holding them like this. Whereas like this, I feel like the lower knob ones are a bit easier. Again, neither bothers me that much. I'll, I'll lose any really. Um, but yeah, we're gonna lock the, the frog back into place now. Now this fella didn't come with the adjustment for the, for the knob. So I think this might be a type six which would, I'm not too sure. I think it would date it late 1800s or very early 1900s. But since there is no frog adjuster, we actually have to do it by hand. So I'm going to loosen the frog nuts. We can wiggle it a small bit forward and then basically just drive them home, locking it into place. Now, ideally you want to do them fairly tight, but obviously you don't want to over torque it either. Um, but if there's any movement on the frog here, that's going to give you some serious problems down the line. So we're just going to carefully place the iron back into place. Careful not to rub it against any metal and blunting it. And then we can throw back on the lever cap. And then that should give us a nice satisfying click. And this fella is ready for road. So let's, uh, let's use it and see how we get on. Now I have two bits of southern yellow pine off bits from the box here. And they're pretty much useless. They'll probably end up as firewood. But what I'm going to do is use them to demonstrate how a joint plane works. Now we can see if we want two of these touching off each other. Uh, see, they do not fit together well at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this fella in my vise here. Lock her into place good and tight. And then I'm going to drive over it a few times with my number eight here. And hopefully that will make it dead flat. And then we're going to do the same on this side. And then they should join together perfectly flat and smooth. And that is perfect if, let's say, we were making a table or trying to join a few boards together. It, it's very often you'll find when you're working with just hand tools that you will need to make things completely flat or completely straight. And that is where this fellow will prove himself invaluable. So I'm going to come on over here now 
and lock this fella in place and get to work. Right, so I think we have that one dead flat and a quick test we can actually do is just throw it up against the edge of the plane and we can see that she's nice and straight. And this board is even thinner. These thin boards are proving themselves difficult to work on. This is why they're nearly a useless wood, but um, they should be grand for just this quick demonstration here. So with this one, I'm once again getting a continuous strip the whole way along the board. It's very hard to keep it straight and square when it's so thin, but shouldn't really be that big a deal. And if we see there now, you might remember earlier, they weren't joined together perfectly, but uh, yeah, right now they are perfectly flush with each other. Let me see if I can get the light in behind there so you can see it, but um, there we go. That is why you would want a jointer plane, but not the only reason. It's grand for jointing boards together. There's another purpose it has, and I have a lid of the toolbox here that I need to make dead flat before it goes on, so I'll demonstrate with that. Sweep everything away there now, nice and clean. So I have this big old board here that I glued together a while back, and what I'm going to do is first of all extend my vise real quick here at the end. So we have the lid of the box locked in our vise here, and we can just grab our number eight here and just you now this place is a total mess i should have cleaned before i started but we're gonna keep on just running over it again and again and again until we have a dead flat now i've taken too big a shave in there from when i was jointing the two boards together so i'm going to twist it back a good bit until we're barely taking a shaving and once we're not taking a shaving, I'm going to twist it in ever so slightly until eventually we do take a shaving again. So and there we go. Once we're taking a shaving, we're going to keep on running over this box until we have all this side dead flat. And then I probably turn it around. Now, the reason this works is because the body of the plane is so long, it'll surf over all the low spots. Uh, and ride the high spots. And when it rides the high spots on the board, it will use the cutter to just shave it off, making it a bit lower. And once you do that enough times, the whole thing should eventually be true. Another thing we'll probably have to do in a few minutes is use winding sticks. They're basically these dead straight sticks that we put here and here. And when we look down the length of them, we should be able to tell if there's any wobble or warping within the board. But um, to be honest, I think for me to be able to finish this, I'm gonna have to move this box and there's so much stuff in it that I think I'm gonna need another person to help me shift this. So I think that pretty much wraps up our video about the Stanley number eight jointer plane. Um, I have my number seven in the box, so this fella will probably be resigned to underneath the desk once more. But you know, now that we have a dead flat and going right well, I think it will come out of retirement fairly often for jobs around the garage. But um, Thanks so for watching lads and uh, stay tuned. Every day we're getting one step closer to finishing this box. So when it's done, there'll be a video with a tour of the box and all the tools inside it. With that being said, good luck and I'll talk to you in the next one.